Uh, first, I will uh, again welcome you all to this webinar jointly organized by the GCSP. I'm Mark Fino, the head of arms proliferation at the GCSP, and we work with our partner, MITO, Middle East Treaty Organization, represented here, among others, by uh, its director, Paul Ingram, who will moderate this webinar. In this webinar, as I said, we will talk about the, the, the current issue, which is uh, the efforts of the international community to, uh, to revert to full compliance with the JCPOA by all its parties and including the United States, because it, uh, the Biden administration has promised to rejoin the agreement. And uh, obviously we'll look at impacts in, on regional security, global security, in particular the prospect of WMD free zone. And we will also, of course, look in particular at the role of the remain, remaining parties uh, in the JCPOA. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm going to go straight to Taya. Uh, Taya Kronberg uh, is going to give um, a European perspective on the issue uh, that is uh, very hot today. Uh, she's a distinguished associate of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI. And I'll hand straight over to you, Taya. Thank you, Mark and Paul. I, I think this uh, discussion is very timely, not only because uh, the Joint Commission of the GCPOA is meeting in Vie Vienna today, but also because uh, uh, all the think tanks uh, that have organized discussions about the GCPOA and its future fate are uh, today often Americans. So I've heard these debates with American participants and, and sometimes you have to ask the question, well, what about the other parties? So I'm really glad that we are having this debate about the other parties. And as an European representative, uh, I was in the European Parliament also as the chair of the Iran delegation. And I would like to remind you of the, of the original goals of this whole process. It was the EU, actually E3, their foreign ministers that started this uh, activity when uh, the US went to Iraq. This was in 2003, the foreign minister said, we need to talk to each other. We need to talk to Iran and actually initiated the process. The EU had three goals. The first was to avoid military action. This was very acute at the time. And actually, if you look at the goals today, you can see that this is a goal that has been achieved. There has been no military intervention so far in Iran. The second goal was uh, the unity of the European uh, countries, EU countries, because they had been divided in the Security Council because of Iraq. So the idea was also to create unity in the European Union among the member states. And this has been successful. I, I think if you look at the EU foreign and security policy, the Iran deal is the one where everybody has agreed. There have been slight discussions, but consensus has always been easy to achieve. The third goal is the most difficult one and, and the one that's up to discussion today and, and maybe in the future also, is the global role of the EU. There was in the, in the Iran deal, Iran process, and in uh, a hope of uh, the EU achieving its global role other than with the increasing number of members, but being actually on the, creating a global arena and being there. And this is maybe one of the goals that have been, have seen many, very many cracks lately. And, and the question is, what is, is the EU's global role, the remaining parts of it that uh, exist. The global role was achieved in 2015. Since then, it has been on the way down. And um, I would also, uh, in history, like to remind you that one of the goals of, of the Iran process was effect, effective multilateralism. So the EU's intention was to actually create 
uh, a stronger role for effective multilateralism. And if you look at the Iran deal today, actually, what we uh, the idea of multilateralism was actually destroyed by President Trump's maximum unilateralism. So the question now is, what uh, is left for the EU to defend? The economic outcomes were lost by the U US sanctions, which actually dramatically humiliated the EU and the idea of strategic autonomy in the EU global strategy. The example, maybe the, the most humiliating example was the Belgian company Swift that was uh, uh, coerced to, to um, shut its contacts with Iranian banks due to American interests. This was a Belgian company, private company. The, it was against the wishes of the EU. Also, the channel of last resort, which was the Instex, it took a long time before it could be established. There was ambiguity of the US and is still ambiguity of the US um, uh, sanctions. So uh, on the economic part, there's still an EU-Iran business forum which does exist and survives. The political role in, in helping Iran to integrate into the international community has van vanished, although some cooperative programs, technical programs still exist. But Iran lost the trust in European capability to, to handle large scale confrontations. And uh, now Iran is leaning toward, towards Russia and China, and I will be very interested to hear their views on, on the situation. The next president, Europe has uh, tried to push for cooperation with the moder moderates and the reformists, and the next president is bound to be a, a conservative. This may not be bad for the deal, but it's definitely not good for the European vision, vision of gradual reforms in the country. So the question to Vienna would be today, what can be done to repair in the current situation with a new American government who has promised to re-enter the deal? The, the very special part has been the sequencing problem, who goes first? Sanctions first or uh, uh, commitment to, to the GCPOA first from Iran's side. And I, I think in a way, uh, this is not specific to this um, deal. This has been a question in all nuclear dis diplomacy. So in a way, I feel that the se sequencing problem, which has now dominated the discussion for a couple of months, is something where the international community should discuss it and maybe define some rules on how to deal with this question. However, with the Vienna Conference Joint Commission meeting today, uh, it seems that at least there's some agreement on how to go about sort of parallel who goes first and who takes the first step. And there must be some, some joint understanding of, of how to do this. Uh, the re-entry hopefully will, will, will um, take place. And I think the re-entry also should mean, and I think there's a uh, fair consensus on this, it should also mean that the GCPOA is about the Iran nuclear deal. This was an agreement among everybody, the participants, and also the regional countries, that this was only about the nuclear deal. Of course, there are issues about the nuclear deal that de have to be dealt with here, for example, the sunset clauses and others, but this is not a question of the regional uh, problems or, or solutions to them. So it's the Iran deal or the future of the JCPOA right now is about the nuclear question of nuclear weapons in Iran. And in this context, also a question about the Middle East nuclear weapon free and WMD free zone in the Middle East. The EU has always supported it. The fact if the GCPOA can be re-established will also support the idea of the Middle East zone. And also the question of the credibility of nuclear diplomacy in the future is at, the, at stake in these discussions. The parallel issue of the regional problems, and I will not go into them uh, more because the, 
EU's role is, is really quite marginal in, in terms of this. But I think that there's a need for a new forum. There's a need for the regional countries to be able to participate. This has been their, their expressed will also. But there's no concrete proposals. There are very diffused proposals about how to deal with these regional questions, although I, I think there must be a number of back channels that are working on this. But it would be interesting to have a proposal from the uh, Gulf countries on how to do this. Finally, I, I would like to confirm once more that the most important factor for the Europeans, both the EU and the E3, is to avoid military conflict. As the negotiations have started and, and, uh, and there's this debate about uh, the deal in the future, the question of a military intervention has, has been pushed to the background and maybe right is so. But the EU was successful in 2003 in preventing a military intervention, military option, and this should be also the guideline for the coming debate. Thank you.